former Yugoslavia. And uh, I came here to the States, to New York, uh, 27 years ago, toward the end of the war in Bosnia. Um, and I came as a refugee. My wife and I were uh, resettled as a priority case. We were on the list to be killed. And uh, we uh, got to the States uh, with a six week year old son. And uh, we needed to get our uh, feet on the ground immediately and, you know, land running <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> the system here doesn't really provide that much help. I mean, uh, I was actually very grateful that I had a job in IRC because after I was demobilized from the Bosnian army, I actually started working for company called International Rescue Committee, IRC. And my boss was Maria's husband. Um, he was a country director, legendary John Fawcett, and Maria was legendary there as well, and operated in very hard, uh, dangerous post in Sarajevo. And um, basically they helped me get the job in IRC um, in New York upon my arrival to the States. Uh, I left the environment of Bosnian work where I was the head of office of Mostar, uh, you know, very rather senior rank and very big budget to work from in really hard conditions. And I came to New York, suddenly uh, the lowest possible rank that exists in IRC was the one to which I was placed. And uh, my age group was older than the people who would belong to that group. So it, it felt a little bit mismatched. And, uh, but there is no way around that. You need to prove yourself when you're here. So I really worked hard and, you know, tried to be involved. And when there is something that maybe some other people wouldn't connect, I would try to make a connection just in order to, to build uh, my presence there. Uh, I would say that they, and, and you know, in, in a while, it took a few years before I started moving up, uh, but it took a few years of really hard work. And then when it's, once it started, uh, uh, once the things opened up, then they opened up a little bit faster than originally. So uh, it's worth the effort, it's worth the, the, the trouble. Um, <clears throat> One of the main obstacles I, I faced was there were cultural differences. Even though I studied linguistics, that's my field is Arabic and English studies. So I knew American culture very well before I even got here. Actually, that's what I was studying on my uh, master's degree. Uh, uh, it's American studies. Even though I knew the country and knew the culture, still there was a bit of a cultural shock when I arrived. And it usually, um, almost never works in your advantage. It almost always works to your disadvantage. And, you know, I tried to, to uh, make the difference between the typical American and myself work for me by every now and then providing a picturesque uh, saying that comes from my country that applies to a certain situation very well, but to apply the approach to work American one, the one that will be easily understood and accepted by my environment. Uh, so I would say that there are some do's and don'ts when it comes to any mixture of cultures. Uh, we all have to understand that this is the country that became our new home. And many of us came in very hard conditions in which uh, if we, we didn't manage to get into this country, we would have been either killed or completely marginalized and we would just sit some place warehoused and wait for you know moment of, of death uh, and that that would be it pretty much uh, so we have to understand that this is the country that gave us a second opportunity and uh, so one of the big don'ts and this is a typical thing for almost all foreigners we tend to compare this country to the one from which we came and often that comparison finds things that are better in our culture than they are in US and vice versa. Foreigners tend to insist more on those that show where American culture is um, 
not so good in that specific field. And foreigners often are seen as somebody who keeps saying, oh, these things are better in my country. These things are, and eventually that frustrates people around you enough that even if they don't tell you, but at least some of them think, well, if it's so much better in your country, why did you come to mine? <laughs> so it's, it's a very logical question. And so we need to make sure that we are respectful toward the country uh, to which we came. We also need to make sure <clears throat> that every task that is given to us, our duty is to do it not just good, not just well, our duty is to carry it out, not just um, the best we can. We don't have that luxury. It has to be so well done, so impressive that your supervisors are gonna be floored and say, oh my God, I need to give this person more or I need to entitle this person with more rank, with more weight because they are doing this so well. And if we just do reasonably well or, or just well, it doesn't stick out and then they will choose a candidate that's easier for them to understand, which is a US candidate. So we really need to kind of uh, place our own, uh, create our own place in that work culture by excelling, really applying ourselves to the best of our ability. <clears throat> uh, I would also say that one of the most important ingre ingredients that one would need is in, on top of uh, going out of your way to do everything you can really well, uh, one should also make sure in that work to constantly build friends, allies, alliances with work colleagues with whom you can participate in common tasks, common projects where you can prove your worth to more than just your supervisor. If you are able to build a reputation of somebody who can be always trusted and who whoever uh, gives him a task or her a task won't have to worry about that. But just to say, oh, I gave it to so-and-so, consider it done because this person is gonna do a great job, not just a good job, a great job uh, uh, taking care of this issue. Uh, I think th that's the best way to, to go around this. Um, so I think that the most important ingredient is that we don't, shouldn't, we shouldn't aspire only to do a good job. We should aspire to do a great job something that will really recommend us as persons and as professionals. One of the other obstacles that all of us are gonna face, in our previous lives, we may had, have had, you know, degrees that, um, that put us maybe in the top group in the society. You may have been an engineer of biochemistry, you know, very popular field nowadays. That's a very big, big deal to be. But when you came here, if your English isn't good enough to present your professional knowledge, all doors are closed for you. There is no way up. So that brings me to the point of English language. All of us have to go out of our way to master English as well as we possibly can, and then make another few steps toward making it even better. <clears throat> because it's bad enough that we as foreigners have foreign accents that can kind of in some environments can work a little bit against you. Not very much though, I have to say, this is the country in which if you have a foreign accent, but your English is really good, it's not gonna work that much against you. In some other cultures and some other languages, your foreign accent would disqualify you completely. That's not the case here. So the fact that we have foreign accents is a little bit of a problem, but if our language, if our syntax is really good, and if we express ourselves in a manner, that, in a manner that's not just understandable, but plastic and picturesque, where we carry our thoughts and our ideas really in a, in a manner that's really, really uh, understandable uh, or catchy even, that will, that will make us more noticed and that will uh, give us an opportunity to show our ideas after our ability to express ourselves has been noticed. So I would say that this is a, 
something one one should really uh, work toward and uh, and we should know that there are no miracles i mean only in the movies can it happen that uh, somebody does something really remarkable and then the guy or girl sitting next to them says i'm a ceo of such and such company come on monday and start working for me only in the movies it doesn't happen in real life so um we really have to understand that uh, um, sometimes you will make a major, major effort and it's not gonna work out. So if you lose your drive, if you lose your optimism, uh, that's gonna crush you down. There is no way around that. And so one should constantly keep applying oneself and just saying, okay, this didn't work, it'll work next time and see what you could improve if maybe it didn't work this time because I failed to do this. Then that means you, you're already improving yourself for the next opportunity. And in this country, there are opportunities if, if one is really constantly you know, running after them, one is able to find that. Uh, and I would also say uh, there is a rather big problem, which is kind of function of the time of, of nowadays time and that is when people apply for jobs. Previously, there would be an HR professional who would read your CV. And that person would be able to figure out based on your CV, if it's reasonably well-written, this is something that this person can do. He or she is good at this or that, or eh, we could use them for this project. So it would give them an idea. Now, the first layer that you have to pass through is robotic. It's not even a person. It's a software that goes through your resume and can easily discard it because some algorithm you didn't meet. And that's a big source of frustration. It's a big problem. <clears throat> and uh, I would say for this, it's critical that CVs are in good shape. I believe you can get that kind of help in, uh, in uh, REF because uh, uh, there is a lot of knowledge in the organization that can help you put the CVs together. I would say another thing that's really critical is the cover letters, personal statements, letters of interest, all of these communications, they must be perfect. So whatever it is that you write down, whatever it is that you want to convey to the reader, then run it by maybe a very sophisticated and well-read native speaker to say, can you just, this is the point I want to make across. Can you help me and tell me if it's coming across? As, as a well-read, sophisticated native speaker, when you read this, do you get this message? Uh, I think this is a, that's going to incre increase your chances of, of being invited for an interview. And in an interview, there, there is no reason to be shy there. You can make a mistake in, in an interview. That's not a big deal. Once you got in, you are actually then presenting your enthusiasm, your actual wish to do a good job and your ideas and, and the richness of your personality. So then these things actually do work for you. All the experiences that we have, that we gained often through painful processes uh, coming here at, in the moment of interview actually work for us because then you stand out. You stand out as somebody who has true history to offer, uh, true life experience to offer, which every project manager wants to find. And I think this um, uh, getting into an interview is way more than half the job done, half of the acceptance. Uh, the biggest obstacle for us is getting through to the point of an interview. So this, for this, I would say cover letters, personal statements, letter of interest, they must be perfect. Uh, I know that uh, Maria's team already is able to help with the CVs. Maybe they can help with this. I actually would like to even check with, uh, in my team, in the Rockefeller Foundation, my unit handles operations. It's called employee services, but we handle global operations. And we, <clears throat> I have a, a person in my staff who is excellent writer, who is a very graceful person. So when she presents something, she knows how to present it in a manner that's going to bring attention to an issue without insulting anybody. Uh, so 
we decided that, we, and there are a lot of communications that we need to send to people in which we either give them instructions or, you know, things like that. When I write things, they are grammatically correct, but in some cases, especially to very pampered community of NGO workers and foundation workers, it sounds almost too militaristic. And it sounds as if I'm barking orders, which I don't hesitate to do that too. In, in life, sometimes there's no uh, way around that. But of course, when you're just uh, communicating a wish or communicating the requirement to behave in such and such manner, you shouldn't sound like you're a military person giving uh, military orders. <clears throat> and a colleague of mine, when after I started, uh, she told me, oh, we really like your <laughs> stern emails. So, okay, she maybe liked the stern emails because they give they gave her a very clear instruction what they need to do and, and in, what, in what order, because it was a very specific thing that everyone had to follow. But that was the time for me to say, I maybe need to address this in a better manner. So I went to that lady who is a very good writer. And I said, you will be our communication conduit. I will not communicate to the rest of the organization through my emails anymore. I will tell you what I would like to say, and you phrase it in a way that will take everything into account. And then everyone in my department does the same. Nobody sends anything just like that. Regular day-to-day -day emails, yes, but anything that goes to everybody has to go through this lady who is now filter. So we achieved the, uh, the, the level that all of our communication is recognizable in style. People recognize our style because it's one person style. One lady writes all of it. And it is very clear, it is very consistent, and it is on a very high level of communication expertise because this lady does have that. So why not capitalize on, on her skill? Why not make it work for the whole department? Uh, <clears throat> this is the person I would like to, to see if she would not mind to, to maybe volunteer with Maria's team. If, if this is the kind of help maybe you could uh, uh, find useful, maybe she would be interested. I know she's a very graceful person who, who cares for issues like this very much. Uh, so, and then the networking. This is one of the biggest issues in, in professional life in America. Networking is for us foreigners to came, who came to this country is often catch 22. You need networking in order to go up and in order to get settled, but you can't network because you still haven't had really a, a, a chance to enter a, a, a company in which you can network. So that's a catch 22. It, how do you uh, network when you have nobody to network with? yet you can't go up without network. So on this, maybe I, I can be of help. I would like to say that maybe through some uh, uh, centralized mean of communication, maybe through Emma or through Marie, Maria, <clears throat> you let me know, um, uh, sorry, you let me know um, if, um, if maybe you need some kind of networking for this or that field. And I would go, um, to a lot of my colleagues who, who really come from all walks of life, uh, just even within my current employer, which is uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, but I can go to all my previous employers, which is two more rather big companies in the States. And, uh, and I would see if there is a way to connect the right person to the right person. So at least to provide that little bit of a push toward networking, if it can be of any help. So I'll be very happy to do that. Uh, this is just in addition to, you know, I don't want to just philosophize to you, but I want to offer something concrete. And I believe this is concrete. If there is a way and somebody is an expert in such and such field, I will gladly connect you to another expert in the field to see if they can do something for you or they can meet with you and provide, um, uh, provide some kind of help uh, in, in your career. And when that's- I May interject, Samir. Yes, please. Thank you so much for these, these um, both points and opportunities. Um, I think we, we all appreciate what you point out about. It's different as have, having someone say like, this is how to do it. And then having someone say, I have a concrete way I can help you do that. Um, 
if if we could um, open up to questions and let the conversation flow from there, um, I am going to stop.